I'd like to thank the organizers of the conference for the invitation, um, more so probably than most of the other participants. I um, work in what I call an intellectual vacuum. I um, teach at a medical school, and topics about the right to health and intellectual property, basically I have to talk to myself. <laughs> and uh, after nearly seven years there, I'm running out of conversation topics to have with me. So it's very nice to be in a stimulating environment. I'd like to explain uh, that I am currently uh, in a project looking at the structural factors that inhibit the implementation of a right to health approach. And uh, one of those structural factors, um, at least I think it is, is the way that intellect, uh, way that human rights norms have developed, in that they are very global, they are very abstract, and they are rarely operationalized sufficiently for them to be of much use to apply to policy. And I think that is a particular case for the relationship between intellectual property, human rights, and access to medicine is an example of that. And so my hypothesis is that in order for human rights norms to be meaningful, that we have to take them to a much greater level of specificity. And uh, I am beginning to try to think about that and what it would entail. Most of you um, are aware that uh, the current standard that is usually referred to is General Comment 14 of the committee, UN Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. This was a landmark in its time. Um, I was among the uh, NGOs and academics who worked with the committee in drafting it. Um, and it's about 18 pages in length. Up to that point, their general comments were about two or three. So it was able to be far more complex and specific, but still not enough. Um, it identified a core obligation, which unlike most obligations in economic and social rights, is not subject to the limitation of available resources, which is to provide essential drugs. Um, but uh, the problem was, it didn't say very much about those essential drugs. Um, as, except to uh, re reference the fact that the World Health Organization developed uh, such a list. Now, there are uh, several dilemmas. One is that, obviously, countries are not paying attention to this because some two billion people, one-third of the world's population, lack access to essential medicines, including in the... 160 countries that are state parties to this uh, conventions. Moreover, as virtually probably everyone here knows, that there is um, a particular problem because pharmaceuticals are developed by corporations that don't have much incentive financially to develop drugs for uh, poor countries. And, of course, there are also intellectual property restrictions um, that we will be talking about in greater detail. So what do you do to try to make a human rights approach more meaningful? Um, there have been a series of what I call global approaches to trying to do so. 
One is to try to identify and promote the human rights responsibilities of pharmaceutical companies in relationship to access to medicines, and there have been a variety of initiatives, including uh, the best well-known is by Paul Hunt, the first special rapporteur on the right to health. There has been a recent book um, that has been published on access to medicines as a human right, um, edited by Lisa Foreman and Julia, Jillian Kohler, which also has several chapters. But the problem is that pharmaceutical companies don't seem to be buying that they have human rights obligations. Another approach um, has been to try to replace patenting with other incentives for drug development, for example, Thomas Pokey's uh, proposal of prizes, um, and um, I won't go into the limitations there. Um, we'll be hearing a lot, I think, this morning, I hope, about broadening and implementing the flexibilities uh, in the TRIPS agreement that permit compulsory licensing and parallel importing. But we still haven't gotten very far uh, in resolving the problems. Now, a human rights approach, the best primary responsibility in the government as the duty holder. So my proposal, which I will develop more in my paper, is that what we need to do is um, conceptualize the responsibilities of governments that accept a right to health as to what it means in access to medicines. Um, first of all, um, I think that it's important that at least the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights recognizes that uh, the one-size-fits-all straitjacket of the TRIPS agreement is not um, relevant for most countries in the world. And human rights bodies have said ad nauseum that human rights obligations should supersede trade obligations and should be recognized in them. And um, I think that it's important for countries to make statements and pass laws with that formulation um, so that they are reading their trade agreements and intellectual property agreements through a human rights lens. Um, okay. Um, I think it's also very important to adopt a legally based national policy, recognizing a right to health or health care, which incorporates a right to essential medicines. Although I love general comment 14, I've discovered that many governments don't love it. Most of them ignore it. Many of them claim it has no legal standing. So it becomes very important for countries to actually incorporate this obligation into national law. One po possibility would be to adopt a national drugs policy consistent with human rights obligations, and there are a number of models, including South Africa's 1996 drugs policy. Another very important, I think, set of factors is for countries to review and amend all national patent laws to make them consistent with the human rights approach. Um, as many of you are aware, there are many countries in the world whose patent laws date from the colonial period. Um, they're not even consistent with development needs. So I, I think this is a second major initiative um, also, if they're going to go forward and try to have a right to essential medicines, there is a need for greater specificity as to what that means. There is need for a national mechanism that would identify a list of essential drugs 
that would be particularly relevant to the needs of their countries and would be more willing than WHO's essential list is to identify drugs that are currently under patent. Uh, there's also a need for a mechanism to monitor the availability and cost of essential drugs in various regions of the country. There are countries that do have essential drugs policies, but empirical research has shown that very frequently only about a third of the public health in institutions have those drugs available, and even in the private sector, rarely are more than two-thirds available. So having that policy, unless they're going to make sure that the drugs get to where they need to, is not very meaningful. Um, the law also should identify the obligation of A, or specific institutions, in the government to ensure that essential drugs be available, accessible, affordable, acceptable, and of good quality, and to be explicit as to what that entails, particularly the affordability. So, um, governments should refuse to adopt a trip plus standards of IP um, protection. I think it should, their policy should preclude the evergreening of patents and um, should preclude patenting of new uses, forms, formulations, or combinations of known medicines. Um, they also, I think another um, important part of this national policy is to remove criminal sanctions for IP infringement. Um, I uh, also want to mention the possibility of countries looking to the Maastricht principles on extraterritorial obligations, which among other things uh, specify that countries need to take measures to ensure that non-state actors, including TNCs and business enterprises, not nullify or impair the enjoyment of economic, social, and cultural rights in other states, which is the opposite of what's happening now, where many countries, including and particularly the United States, their policies on pharmaceuticals are being shaped by what's best for the major TNCs in operating out of their country. Uh, in a 2009 report, Anand Grover, who is the second and current special rapporteur on the right to health, uh, provides a menu of national laws, particularly for developing countries and less developing countries, uh, that he recommends in, would incorporate the flex abilities in the TRIPS agreement, uh, such as making full use of transition periods, which very few have, uh, defining criteria of patentability with a very high standard, um, uh, issuing uh, compulsory licenses and um, providing them for government use, uh, adopting an international exhaustion, principle uh, to facilitate parallel importing, uh, creating um, meaningful exceptions uh, to patent rights. I have put the wrong thing down in my PowerPoint. Uh, allowing for opposition and re revocation of procedures. Um, he also proposes excluding diagnostic therapeutic and surgical methods from patenting are relevant to the treatment of human beings. Um, if uh, countries are going to make broad use of compulsory licenses, they need to streamline and simplify the laws and regulations to be able to do so. I also think it's important to adopt a broad research exemption. So that's my current menu, um, and 
where I'm hoping to go in writing up this paper, and I would be very interested in any other suggestions from other people here. Thank you very much.